Dr. David Ash uh, is our speaker, and he'll be giving a, a talk about, well, as you can see, uh, behavioral economics. Uh, Dr. Ash is currently the executive director of the Penn Medicine Center for Healthcare Innovation. Uh, he is a professor of way too many things, professor of medicine, professor of medical ethics and health policy, uh, professor of healthcare management, and professor of operations, information, and decisions. Uh, he has, uh, previous to this uh, position, uh, held a variety of other uh, key positions, uh, including directing the Center for Health Equity Research and Promotion at the VA Medical Center, um, uh, directing the RWJ Health and Society Scholars Program at Penn, uh, and he was also the executive director of the Leonard Davis Institute of Health Economics. Uh, Dr. Ash, and you'll, you'll see, that is a, is a fabulous speaker. He's won uh, teaching awards. Uh, he has won research awards. Actually, the thing that I'm surprised that I don't see on this long list of awards is there's not something for, you know, best baritone in the, in the barbershop quartet. Yeah, I, I, you just it's in there, that. yeah, yeah. <laughs> There'll be a little singing later. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's all. And then following uh, Dr. Ash's presentation, uh, Dr. Lawrence Helmken, uh, from the, our, our own Department of Health Policy and Management will serve as the discussant. I'm uh, happy to be here, honored to be here, um, and wanted to talk about behavioral economics. Um, and I definitely want uh, to have this to be an engaging, um, well, at least I want to engage you. Hopefully it will be engaging. Let me just see what I need to do to move advanced slides. Maybe this. Um, I don't know whether you require disclosures. I'm used to disclosures in schools of medicine. Uh, so I'm a principal at a behavioral economics uh, consulting firm and have received a variety of grants. Some other disclosures that are worth getting off my chest. <laughs> um, I want to start with this story of John Corzine, who was the governor of New Jersey uh, a while back. And he had this horrible car accident in this SUV. He was sitting in the front passenger seat. Um, uh, and uh, he ended up in a trauma center in New Jersey with multiple broken bones, multiple lacerations, mechanically ventilated. It's amazing that he survived. What's even more amazing to me was that he wasn't wearing a seatbelt at the time, and apparently he never wore seatbelts. State troopers had constantly been beseeching him uh, to uh, wear a seatbelt, and he just didn't do it. And I mention this um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, John Corzine was governor of New Jersey. Before that, he was senator from New Jersey. Before that, he was the CEO of Goldman Sachs. He's responsible for taking Goldman Sachs public, made hundreds of millions of dollars. No matter what you think about John Corzine politically or how he made his money, no one would say that he was stupid. And yet, he wasn't wearing a seatbelt when I would think that pretty much every American knows that seatbelts save lives. So I bring it up because of the limits of rational thinking and education and otherwise very, very well-resourced uh, people. Um, I don't think a slide like this is, is uh, uh, New to anybody in, in, a, in a setting like this, individual behavior affects health. 71% of the U.S. population is overweight or obese. Smoking is the leading cause of preventable mortality. More people, more Americans die each year from tobacco-related diseases than all of the American men and women servicemen died in all of World War II. About 75% of the $3 trillion we spend on health care in the U.S. each year is attributable to obesity, type 2 diabetes, coronary artery disease, and cancer, arguably all of those have a substantial behavioral component. And I like showing um, uh, this pie chart to my um, uh, basic science colleagues, mostly to illustrate the importance of behavioral patterns, at least trumping genetic uh, uh, predisposition or inadequate health care. The problem, I think, that occurs for a lot of, you know, so I work at Penn Medicine, uh, so many of the determinants of health occur outside of the reach of doctors and hospitals. So even someone with a chronic illness might only spend a couple of hours a year in front of a doctor or a nurse, but they'll spend over 5,000 waking hours a year, if you do the math, doing everything else. And it's during those 5,000 hours that so much of our health outcomes are determined. And really, up until now, health systems and physicians and nurses had no way of knowing what it was that patients were doing uh, during those 5,000 hours. And even if they did, didn't really have good mechanisms for intervening, and interceding, and improving health during that time. I want to paint a more optimistic picture of that moving forward. But this, in my mind, is a kind of 5,000 hours problem 
uh, that um, I think uh, desperately needs attention given the strong importance of behavior in healthcare. Just to set up the story some more, I want to give another part, uh, another element to this in a much more medical context. This is a great study done by Nitish Chowdhury at Harvard <coughs> with a bunch of other colleagues, and the premise was this. Someone discharged from the hospital with a heart attack, all of them are going to be discharged on three or four medicines. Everyone's going to get aspirin, statin, beta blocker, maybe they'll get an ACE inhibitor, Plavix, something like that. And it's long been recognized that when you increase copayments to medications, you decrease their uh, use. And so in this randomized control trial, what was done was the elimination of copayments for uh, half of a group by random assignment of nearly 6,000 patients following MI. So half of them had the usual copayment for those, those four medicines, and the other half had a zero copayment. And the results, which you can see here on the right, were that with a standard copayment, adherence was only 39%, which I think we can all agree is abysmal adherence for medications that are truly life-saving after a heart attack. And when you make the copayment zero, adherence went up. And in fact, that difference is statistically significant, but I don't think anybody should be satisfied from a clinical standpoint with 45% adherence to aspirin, statin, beta blocker, Plavix after a heart attack. Now you'd think you just had a heart attack. These are incredibly effective medications that could prevent you from having a second one. You'd be scared out of your head. The medication's free. Almost all these medications are once a day. They're easy to take, very well tolerated. You think adherence would be somewhere up here. And it's incredibly disappointing that it's at only 45% even if you make the medications free. And the primary outcome of this particular study was um, new major um, vascular uh, events or revascularization, and there was no difference when you made the medications free. I bring this up to illustrate that some of our intuitions about how behavior uh, is formulated, um, I think, are very limited, right? So it's, John Corzon wasn't wearing a seatbelt, even though he was an incredibly smart and resourced guy, and lots of people don't take their medications even when they're free. So much of our health planning is based on this perspective that people are rational that we get information, we process it in some kind of mechanical way, and then our behavior changes. The old approach is to change someone's behavior, you have to change their mind. Educate people about the dangers of smoking. Convince people that vaccination is safe. I think, it, I don't know how much the CDC budget is for smoking cessation. You may know, Leighton, I don't, I don't know, but it's, it's an enormous budget. I think 95% I think of it is devoted to educating Americans that smoking is dangerous. And I think that all, most Americans already know that smoking is dangerous. They just keep smoking. So this concept that, that we're rational people and that's how um, we should motivate change, I think, is very, very flawed. Instead, I like to think of the mind as a high-resistance pathway. If you hit my patellar tendon with a reflex hammer, my leg is going to jerk out. It's a spinal reflex. It doesn't require any neural pathways really above my spinal cord. And it's far more certain and far quicker than if I had to think about it in the first place. And I think what we all need in terms of thinking about this 5,000 hours problem are, uh, is the identification of what our behavioral reflexes are. What are the kinds of things that we do naturally that we can harness in order to improve behavior, to improve individual and population health? And so this is the story that I've been telling. Our, the science and our understanding of motivation has really been evolving. Uh, I still think this is the dominant view, that information is what's necessary. It assumes that people don't know that education, counseling, and literature is what matters. The next phase has been the use of really standard economics, um, financial incentives, for example. It assumes that people are rational expected value maximizers and that the size of the reward is what matters. If we pay doctors more for quality, they'll deliver better quality. In fact, we see this, you know, most, most management uh, uh, you know, performance systems are based fundamentally on transactional economics, and this has been applied, and I'll, I'll give you some examples, increasingly in healthcare as well. Um, but as the, the story about medication adherence when you eliminate copays reveals, that can't be the full story either. And I'll spend the rest of the time talking about behavioral economics. Um, and I'd actually like to see what, where that arrow was going. So, you know, maybe there are going to be even better things a few years from now, but at the moment, my view is that the dominant approach to motivation is based on behavioral economics. This recognizes that people are not rational, they're irrational. 
But the real value of behavioral economics isn't recognizing that people are irrational. It's recognizing that people are irrational in highly predictable ways. And once you know the tool, the errors that they make, the predictable errors, the repeatable errors, we're much better able to help them. So let me give you some examples of irrational behavior and solutions that we could apply to this irrational behavior. So one is present bias preferences, or myopia. We tend to think of the issues that are in front of us as far more important than the ones that are in the future. So you're on a diet, and there are those chocolate chip cookies that I saw out on the table right there. You know exactly what's going to happen if you eat those cookies. It's going to, make your, it's going to set you back in your diet. Those calories are going to show up someplace on your body where calories tend to show up in your body, and you don't want that. But the cookies are there right now, and they look pretty good, and the diet can wait till tomorrow. And you know, we were all, everyone's nodding their head. We all have examples of that in our life. Maybe it's about eating. Maybe it's about saving for retirement. But, but things in the, in the present loom very, very large to us. Many of the most important healthcare interventions that we have involve some kind of delayed gratification, right? So the antihypertensive, the drug I take today to lower my blood pressure, which has no symptoms, I'm taking it today to prevent the stroke I might have in the future. In fact, if it's successful, I'll never have that stroke. I'll never even know that that was a stroke that I avoided. And so I have to accept a certain amount of cost today for an uncertain and perhaps an unmeasurable, in fact, at an individual level, totally unmeasurable outcome that's far into the future. And that's, I think, a problem with so much of the preventive care that we um, uh, supply. Uh, framing and segregating uh, rewards. There are an enormous number of, we were actually just uh, chatting about this before the talk, enormous number of companies that provide rewards for healthy behavior. And often those are bundled into your paycheck. So for example, you get $100 off your premium for this, or $500 if you're not a smoker. I'll talk about some of those programs. The problem is that they often get bundled into your paychecks. When your paychecks are directly deposited, there's a lot of extra money uh, going on in the, in, in, in the paychecks. Even if it's $500 and you're paid every other week, that's about $20 a week. Um, so it gets reduced and it loses its potency. But you can imagine that if you handed someone a $50 gift card for something, one-tenth the cost, it might be much more immediate and much more salient. And so we can think about ways in which um, solutions based on that. Overweighting small probabilities. Humans have a horrible time with probabilities, which explains in part why lotteries, state lotteries are so incredibly popular. They return pennies on the dollar, and yet it's a multi-billion dollar industry, state lotteries. Um, I, I saw this bumper sticker, I am not making this up, that said state lotteries are a special tax on people who can't do math. Uh, and yet, people in, invest in this. And so you could imagine providing probabilistic rewards in lotteries in order to know, people don't have a sense that, uh, that, don't have an intuitive sense that one in 100 is different from one in 10,000. Right? There's a hundredfold difference there. It just seems like a rare event. And you can exploit that in providing probabilistic rewards. You have a chance to win an iPad, a chance to win a dream house, your dream car, whatever. It's an in, a tiny little chance where people will see the outcome and not recognize that it's discounted so much by probability. We can use that to our advantage. State lotteries use that, unfortunately, to people's disadvantage. Regret aversion. One of the things that people hate is that sense of regret. I don't know if you remember, there was a TV commercial for V8 juice like 15 years ago. Someone's having some kind of beverage, and they go, oh, I could have had a V8. That sense of regret. And we hate that. People hate that, that sense. Uh, I mean, I, I can actually connect these things. Remember a few months ago, there was that um, enormously large lottery prize, right? That Powerball thing it was around the country, billions of dollars. It was like, well, maybe it was a billion dollars. So I just told you that like, lotteries are a bad idea. But of course, there I am at the office, and there's an office pool to buy a bunch of lottery tickets. And my first, first thought is, well, I'm not going to buy a lottery ticket. Lotteries are a special tax on people who can't do math. I'm not going to do that. And then I thought, well, God, what if they win? You know, so then all my colleagues are going to win, and, I, and they're, you know, they don't show up for work anymore, and uh, they're on the beach, and I lost. Like, that would be the worst thing, was to see my colleagues win, and I didn't join in. So of course, I like, put my money in there, and I lost because that's exactly what happens. But at least, at least I avoided the regret. I anticipated this regret, and I, I acted on it, not necessarily um, uh, in a useful way. 
And I'll go through some of these others, loss aversion and status quo bias. But you can think, and I'll show you some examples of once we know that we do these things and we all do them, we can think about tricks that we can deploy that will help us overcome this. So forewarned is forearmed. Um, the point, once you recognize that people are irrational, you're in a better position to help them. If, we, if we're stuck with a mental model that everyone's rational, then our tools are education. And education's been a, very limit, a tool of very limited effectiveness in changing health behavior. So now we've got more tools. So this is actually a very optimistic kind of message, which is what I want. OK, defaults and, and status quo bias and the like. I think many of you have probably seen slides like this. It shows the effective level of consent for uh, solid organ donation across a variety of countries in Europe. The countries in yellow are those that have effectively an opt-out policy you must affirmatively say you don't want your organs donated, otherwise they're donated. And the countries in purple have an opt-in policy, which is effectively what we have in the United States. And it doesn't take any complicated statistical tests to understand the difference here. Even countries that speak the uh, same language, Germany and Austria, we see tremendous differences in the effective consent rate simply by changing the default. Right? So no one's liberty is trample on here. You can say no if you want to. It's just what happens if you don't say anything. And that's the difference in default. Very, very powerful. A colleague of mine, Scott Halpern, pulmonary critical care physician, took this sort of into the clinic. And I, I am amazed that the IRB uh, let him get away with this. Um, uh, but here's what he did. He took about 95 patients who had very advanced lung disease for whom an advanced directive was really actually relevant and, of course, a very high-stakes kind of situation. And he randomized these individuals into three groups. And one group um, got what would be called a comfort care default. So you might think of the two extremes in an advanced directive for your life is, do you want everything done to save your life, or would you rather have comfort care, make sure you're comfortable even if you don't live as long as a result? So one group got the comfort care default. It was pre-exed on a piece of paper. I want my health care providers and agent to treat me by helping relieve my pain and suffering, even if that means they may, I may not live as long. Half the people got something that said, I want my health care providers and agent to treat me by helping me to live as long as possible, even if that means I may suffer more pain and suffering. I wouldn't have written suffer my, more suffering, but he wrote it that way. Um, and then a third of the group got it uh, where it wasn't checked off. And you could cross off what you didn't want and change the thing you wanted. Real patients advanced lung disease for whom this is relevant and, and, you know, and a real advanced directive. And here are the results. Those who were, who were randomized to the comfort care default, 77% of those picked comfort care. And those who were randomized to the life extension default, only 43% chose comfort care. An amazingly powerful result. This, this suggests that these, these preferences weren't there to be biopsied. They were altered by the, the use of the default. And so what the IRB made them do was go back and tell them that this was a study that they were in. It was a deception study. And so Scott had to go back and say, yeah, we were just messing with you. <laughs> we do that. Um, uh, would you like to change your mind and explain that we had defaulted you into this? And it turns out, I think two people changed their mind. Amazingly powerful and actually very, in some respects, concerning, right? With this, Incredible power comes incredible responsibility for very high stakes situations. Um, here's another example. We have a, a, many places have a problem with their physicians prescribing brand name drugs when generic drugs are available. Basically, generic drugs should be just as good as brand name drugs. They're much cheaper. And what you see here, this is actually at Penn Medicine, each one of these lines, these colored lines, is a different drug. And what you see over a period of time is the percent that were ordered as generic. In some cases, as low as 15%. In some cases, always generic, but consistent over time. Mitesh Patel, one of the junior faculty who works with us, um, wrote a little piece of software, or changed something in the physician order entry of the system so that you, it, it basically opted you into generic drugs unless you said dispense as written, which is a, a, a format that's been used in paper prescriptions. Put that in place, suddenly these are the results. Now what I think is really amazing isn't just that everything went up to the top, but this greenish line here. And what that is, 
is Synthroid, which is a synthetic thyroid hormone. And I don't know if any of you are clinicians, but it turns out that that's a drug in which the generic and the brand name are not entirely equivalent. There's a legitimate reason for sticking with the brand name drug. And so what this shows is that physicians you know, moved up to, to um, using generic prescribing, but, but they weren't unthinking about it. Those who are prescribing Synthroid often stuck with the Synthroid. So again, a very optimistic message um, and also shows the power of defaults in clinical behavior. So here's another one, and I think I'm gonna sp I'll speed up a little bit, but we all know this. People have time inconsistent preferences, right? So um, you, every single one of you has done this. I don't know you, but I am sure this is the case, right? You, you set your alarm for something earlier than you might have otherwise set it for, let's say 7 a.m., so they can get to the gym before work or do something, right? And then what happens at 7 a.m.? Yeah, you hit the snooze button, right? I mean, our alarm clocks have snooze buttons for a reason. People, people want those snooze buttons, right? So what could you do? And, and you've all had this, so I've got to get up. So what do you do? What are the kinds of things you do? Put it on the other side of the room, right. Anything else? Set it even earlier, okay. Some people run their watch fast for that purpose. Yeah, yeah, so that, that's the point. Is we, we know that we're gonna do this so we can create strategies around it. So like here's a strategy, multiple alarm clocks. Um, and it's because we recognize this, we recognize this bias we have. This is not an education thing. This is just a behavior thing. Um, I saw this on Amazon, this actual product, $39.99 at Amazon, called Clocky. The alarm clock has wheels, you just put it on your night table, and if you hit the snooze button more than once, it jumps off the table and bleeps and runs around the room, you have to chase the thing. <coughs> and um, it sounds like a pretty good idea, except, um, and then I looked at it again when I was preparing for this, and it, it's been heavily discounted. I think because it doesn't take too long to realize that this is actually not a product you wanna have, right? It's gotta be incredibly irritating. But the first idea about it, I think, sounded pretty good. So again, trying to overcome uh, our natural foibles. These are kinds of commit, these are forms of commitment contracts that help us overcome uh, those particular problems. So um, these two plates have the same um, amount of food on them, but actually, and Brian Wansing at Cornell has been a leader in demonstrating that, that people will eat much less with smaller plates. We have these visual cues uh, that, um, and it turns out that plates have been getting bigger over time. It's not, I don't think it's the entire cause of the obesity epidemic, but plates have been getting bigger over time. Someone told me there was a study about demonstrating this by looking at pictures of the Last Supper and comparing the size of the plates to the size of Jesus' head, and that ratio has been increasing over time. Disulfiram, antabuse, is a drug you can take. If you drink alcohol after taking that drug, you get incredibly nauseated. So it's a pre-commitment strategy that if you've taken disulfiram, you will be really vomit your guts out if you drink alcohol. So it's a way to, uh, to treat uh, alcohol abuse. Um, yearly gym memberships, right? So everyone signs up with their New Year's resolution. You have to sign up for the whole year. These are kinds of commitment contracts. They don't work, as you know, because the gyms all clear out in February, and only the actual diehard gym, uh, gym goers go to this. And lots of ways in which we can think about strategies, pre-commitment strategies, um, temptation bundling is something uh, uh, developed by Katie Milkman um, uh, at Wharton. And her view is, let's say you have something you really like to do. You like to listen to a podcast or read a certain novel, um, you know, read trashy books. You only allow yourself to read those when you're at the gym. You know, bundle the thing you're supposed to do with the thing um, that you want to do. Um, and I'll go, th go through some other examples like this. Scott Halpern again. I mentioned the uh, pulmonary critical care physician just completed a study about a year ago with um, over 2,500 employees of CVS Caremark who were motivated to smoke, and they were randomized into different groups. I'll just um, condense the study a little bit and say that there were three groups, a control group, a group that was rewarded up to $800 if they quit smoking, and a group that had to put $150 of their own money down, which they would lose if they didn't complete. Uh, quit smoking, and then if they did quit smoking, it was supplemented with another $650 um, uh, from the outside. So they could gain uh, $800 or they could lose um, $150. And what you see here is that the control group had only a 6% quit rate, which is what you typically see when you use standard smoking cessation interventions. The reward group had a 
uh, biochemically confirmed quit rate at six months, which is also what we've seen with some financial incentives. And the deposit contract had something in between, but that was only because lots of people refused to put their money down. People, in some sense, had, unfortunately, a realistic notion that smoking is really hard to quit. And so many more people did not put their money down. When you look at a per-protocol analysis, it turns out that 90% of the people were willing to enter a reward program, and 17% of those individuals quit. But only a tiny fraction were willing to put their own money down. But if you put your own money down, you are much more likely to quit. It's really a sign of your mo intrinsic motivation. Um, CVS actually rolled this whole program out um, all over. So uh, framing of the message. I want to talk about framing for a bit. Again, another issue that is non-rational um, uh, but incredibly effective. So I think a great study that was done out of Canada, 561 smokers were randomly assigned to be told how bad their pulmonary function was in the usual way. So a doctor would typically say something like, your lung capacity is at 65% of that predicted, which is a very sterile kind of message. But half of the people were told their lung age. You think you're 55, but you have the lungs of a 72-year-old. I have no idea how they generated these numbers. Much more salient information. And it turns out that the quit rates for those who were told their pulmonary function in units of lung age were much more likely to quit. In fact, it didn't even matter what the lung age was. It's just that you used the term, you brought age into it. It was much more effective. So framing of information um, is incredibly important. Uh, uh, Lawrence and I were talking, and, and Leighton were talking about um, health insurance choices. I'm, I'm right in the middle of my open enrollment period at the University of Pennsylvania where I have to select my health insurance. And this is, this is not actually a screenshot of what my choices are, but it looks just like it. This is what it looks like. And, uh, you know, it's got co-payments, deductibles, co-insurance, out-of-pocket maximums. So I, uh, as Leighton said, I used to, for 15 years, I ran the Leonard Davis Institute of Health Economics at Penn. And I have no idea what the best health insurance is for my family. Who could possibly figure this out? Every single one of these things is a financial incentive, ostensibly designed to steer me in a particular direction for my health care. But I would submit that an incentive that you can't understand is one that could never be effective. Um, in fact, I think that the, the, um, the, my health insurance choices look more like my cell phone bill. And yet my cell phone bill is largely designed to be complicated to hide fees. And so we're using the same strategy to motivate people. It just seems completely backwards to me. Right? If we want to motivate people, we should be um, uh, creating simple rules. And so my colleague, Kevin Volpo, I need to credit for a lot of this uh, thinking, and George Lowenstein at um, Carnegie Mellon actually worked with Humana to create a new insurance plan called uh, Simplicity, which is basically just based on copayments. Much simpler design, and they've rolled that out because uh, people can understand it. Simple programs can be highly effective. This is a study um, uh, Kevin did, in fact, similar to what uh, Scott Halpern did in, in Employees of General Electric. Um, uh, uh, where by random allocation, half of the employees had a usual smoking cessation program. This is just standard economics, not behavioral economics. And the other half could get up to $750 if they quit smoking. And you can see that at 12 months, the quit rate was 15% in those who received a financial incentive. A much simpler design can be very, very effective. This is a very transactional approach, but there are many behavioral economic lessons. One of them was the General Electric was so excited about the study, we got a tripling of quit rates among their employees that they wanted to roll it out for all of their 150,000 employees in North America. But what happened is they turned the $750 reward for smokers who quit, that's how the study was designed, you got $750 if you were a smoker and you quit, into a $625 charge to smokers who don't quit. Right? So they turned a kind of carrot into a stick. Any idea why they did that? Why might GE have done that? Rewards and penalties are not symmetric, but why would they have done that? Who objected? Well, the non-smokers objected. It was politically unacceptable to the non-smokers to say, why are you paying that guy $750 to quit something he wasn't supposed to be doing in the first place? Where's my money? I was never a smoker. It was, so yet when designing these incentives, they were sort of mathematically equivalent, but they were not socially equivalent. 
And so in thinking about these interventions, you need to think not just psychologically, but really uh, very much um, socially. Um, so framing matters. Clergyman to superior, may I smoke while praying? The answer is no. Clergyman to superior, may I pray while smoking? Yes. Very different um, views according to the frame. Uh, here's a recent study um, we just published uh, um, in which we did a randomized control trial of uh, overweight or obese employees. We set everyone at a 7,000 daily step goal using the um, accelerometer in their smartphone, because these are actually remarkably accurate, 13-week trial. And uh, there were financial incentives um, provided. So one group was randomized to control. They just got feedback on how much they walked. One group got could get a hundred, I'm sorry, a dollar forty for every day they hit uh, a seven thousand uh, step mark. Another group got the expected value of a dollar forty a day in a lottery incentive, and the fourth group was given so a dollar forty a day works out to forty two dollars a month. They got forty two dollars at the beginning of the month in a virtual account, and they lost a dollar forty for every day they didn't walk seven thousand steps. So mathematically. These three arms are equivalent, like from an expected value standpoint. But these, it turns out that these three arms were no different. The actual, the gain incentives didn't produce any statistically significant difference in walking compared to control, but the loss incentive had effectively a 50% increase or 15% in absolute terms um, percentage of people who walked. It makes no sense rationally. It's exactly the same amount of money but it was incredibly effective behaviorally. Loss incentives were much more powerful. Here's one. Uh, my own insurance company used to do this. Um, and, and maybe there are insurance companies around here that have done this. Complete 120 workouts in 365 days, and you'll be eligible for re reimbursement of $150. This company hates it when I bring this up, but it was a really idiotic design. And, um, and here are the design flaws. Um, I would have quizzed you on it, except I put the answer up here. Um, the rewards are provided only once a year, right? So I have to go to the gym now, but I don't get my reward for like 15 months from now or 12 months. Um, there's a single high threshold. I have to do 120 workouts. 110, not enough. So it clearly is targeting the wrong people. This is a, if, if I don't go to the gym at all, 120 workouts a year is a completely daunting, impossible number. If I was already going to the gym 120 times, this is great, I'll take the 150 bucks. This is a very good program to attract gym goers into your health plan, but it's not a very good program to turn couch potatoes like me into triathletes. Like, it's unlikely to work that way. Um, so, uh, and, and it, you know, because it fails a, a bunch of tests of reason. Um, and, and I think in general you have to pace feedback to coincide with behaviors, right? So the, the enemy of going to the gym is the couch. I, you know, I could sit on the couch that's a very immediate thing, sitting on the couch with that bowl of potato chips. Like, that's right now. Going to the gym or taking my medicines, that requires, which is, let's say, a daily activity, requires lots and lots of um, uh, uh, engagement. So um, I'm going to move into uh, uh, discussions of how we've used some technology to solve that particular problem, show you some studies, and then um, wrap up with some views about how to move from financial incentives a little bit into social incentives. So we've used pill bottles like this. There are lots of them that exist. In fact, this, this particular brand is going out of business. Um, but um, they're, these are like wireless pill bottles. In this particular case, there's a little chip in the cap. There's a Bluetooth connection to this thing, which plugs into the wall. And then this sends a cell signal to us in our laboratory. So we can tell whether people are opening their pill bottles or not. That allows us to monitor things like medication adherence, which is going to become um, relevant in, in a, just a minute. And then we pair it with these um, regret lotteries. And the regret, as I mentioned, is an incredibly powerful motivator. Lotteries and prob probabilities are incredibly powerful, um, or at least can be exploited. And here's how we use these regret lotteries. We give everyone a two-digit number, let's say 42. And if a 42, and, and every day, we randomly draw a number between 0 and 99. And if a 42 comes up, will give you $100. That'll happen one in 100 times. And if you get a one-digit match, like a four in the first place or a two in the second place, 49 or 12, will give you $10. That will happen roughly one out of five times, 18 out of 100, in fact. 
And then we message you every day, depending upon whether you took your medicines the day before. So we'll say something like, 42 came up. You want $100 up, but you didn't take your medicine yesterday, so you don't get the money. Take your medicine today, and you may be, be a winner tomorrow. So we create regret. We exploit probabilities. We have random reinforcement. It's got all sorts of behavioral economic um, bells and whistles. So you may think this is a hokey thing, but we do all sorts of studies with this. And one of the earliest studies, again, led by my colleague Kevin Volp, demonstrated that these lotteries tremendously improve warfarin use. Warfarin, Coumadin, is an anticoagulant used to prevent strokes in people with a heart rhythm disturbance. It's a very dangerous medicine. If it's not used correctly, you take too much, you can bleed. Take too little, you can clot. Lots of people are not adherent to their medication. These are historical things. They're not head-to-head. -head. Percent of incorrect doses was around, is around 22%. But when you use these lotteries, you can get the doses, uh, the percentage of incorrect doses way down. And in fact, you can get um, uh, INR is called, is, stands for International Normalized Ratio and is a measure of uh, is your blood in the, in the right, has the right degree of thinness. And these lotteries also reduce the time out of INR range. So as hokey as you think this is, it, it tends to work. They're very hard to do these things without some form of scale. The early experiments we did with research assistants calling patients, that's a very expensive thing. You couldn't deploy that to a population of people being seen at GW, for example. So um, the scale is almost always going to require some combination of an understanding of behavior plus technology to create scalable behavior change. And so um, I'm going to skip this. Um, but I want to give you a little infomercial for something that we had developed um, uh, to, to, to deliver on that scale. So uh, as I mentioned, I'm from the University of Pennsylvania. Ben Franklin founded the University of Pennsylvania. We're very proud of that fact. Um, I think Ben Franklin actually was the world's first behavioral economist, although he didn't call himself that. And he wrote a pamphlet in 1758 called The Way to Wealth. And it was a recognition of all the psychological foibles that we all have that get in the way of our financial well-being. Right? So he wrote, the taxes are indeed very heavy, but we are taxed twice as much by our idleness, three times as much by our pride, and four times as much by our folly. But then he went on to give some prescriptions. They're really almost behavioral economic prescriptions for how to get ourselves out of this mess. And you've seen, all of you have seen these things, right? Early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. Never leave that till tomorrow, which you can do today. At, at the working man's house, hunger looks in but dares not enter. Laziness travels so slowly that poverty soon overtakes him. These little aphorisms. Um, and I think they're sort of, they're, they're trying to recognize principles of behavioral economics. How many of you know Stephen Wright, the comedian? I'm looking at this demographic and I'm thinking, one per, a couple of people. I thought he was an incredibly funny guy. He's not active now. I, I put his picture here because he actually looks like Ben Franklin. Um, Stephen Wright had um, said, the early bird gets the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. Um, and hard work pays off in the future, but laziness pays off now. <laughs> and that principle underlies so much of the problem that we have in healthcare or financial planning or pretty much anything. And, and it is really the, the present bias problem that we have. So um, as a kind of, uh, I mentioned that this is all the, um, the, from the way to um, wealth, and as a kind of homage to Ben Franklin, um, Kevin uh, Volpe and I created something that we call the Way to Health, and it's an information technology platform that links a bunch of peripheral devices, um, pill bottles, Fitbits, um, blood pressure cuffs, scales. It doesn't really connect blenders, but at some point we're going to connect blenders. Um, we get, the server gets informa servers get information on behavior. We have a variety of rules engines that allow you to, uh, us to message patients and it automatically transfers funds in uh, sort of behavioral economic interventions to patients who do things right or do things wrong. Um, I'm gonna, I think I better wrap up quickly because I'm looking at the time, but I'm, I'll mention just a couple of studies that we've done with this. Um, one was a recent one in which we uh, uh, looked at the effect of financial incentives to physicians, patients, or both on lipid levels. This was a forearm cluster randomized trial of uh, primary care physicians at Penn, Harvard, and Geisinger Health System in Pennsylvania. We randomized the physicians to a, a usual care arm, to physician incentives where the physicians could get up to over $1,000 per patient who they got to their LDL goal, their LDL cholesterol goal. The patients could get incentives based on these regret lotteries, or an arm in which 
the patients and the physicians shared the financial incentive to get to the goal. So four particular arms, and the main outcome was LDL reduction at 12 months. So 1,500 patients, over 200 primary care physicians. And here are the results. Um, what you can see is that everyone got a drop in their LDL, which is why we do controlled experiments. But it was actually only the shared incentive group that did better. Giving financial incentives to patients and to physicians simultaneously was the only arm in which the effect beat out um, uh, control. Uh, and I'm going to just go over these summary findings um, uh, very quickly uh, just to, to hit them home. So physician incentives were no better than control. It's an enormous amount of transactional economics designed to improve physician behavior. Bonuses for quality improvement. When we set this up and said that we were going to pay physicians $1,000, more than $1,000, to get their patients' cholesterol down, which is, uh, speaking as a clinician, is one of the easiest things you can do, much easier than getting their blood pressure down and far easier than managing diabetes. Everyone said that's way too much money. $1,000, you could have 50 of these patients, you could get an extra $50,000. And we said, well, if it doesn't work at $1,000, it's never going to work. And it turned out it didn't work. So, you know, straight up financial incentives to do this didn't work. Patient incentives were also no better than control. Um, but shared incentives, each at half value, were better than control. And that is a pretty interesting finding, I thought, because rarely do you take two things that don't work, cut them in half strength, and combine them, two inert substances, and turn it into something effective. Except when you take a little step back, you can realize that it takes two things in the medication adherence world or in, in the cholesterol reduction world to make um, L LDL cholesterol go down. Someone has to prescribe the medication, that's the physician, and someone has to take it. When we gave physician incentives or shared incentives, we increased the proportion of physicians who prescribed the medication. But it wasn't enough to get the LDL lower than control. When we had patient incentives or shared incentives, we increased adherence on the patient side, but it wasn't enough to take LDL to a level lower than control. Only when we had both shared incentives um, did we get the LDL down. So it's a kind of vindication of the doctor-patient relationship as played out in the world of behavioral economics. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to just very briefly mention social incentives, and then I'm going to um, give some time for questions. Um, there are lots of reasons why financial incentives are awkward, they're expensive, they can seem inappropriate, they're not always legal, and they can backfire. And I'm very interested these days in social incentives, and I'll just give you uh, 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 two quick examples of that. A great study done in Israel. I don't know, so I used to um, use daycare for my kids. I picked the daycare place that had the longest hours. And even so, occasionally, I might be like one of the last parents coming to pick up my kids from daycare. And the daycare place, of course, hate that, right? And so, uh, and the kids hate it too. They don't want to be the last one picked up. It seems like mommy or daddy doesn't love them. So this um, daycare center did, in Israel did something that, that my daycare center also did, is they created a fine for late pickup, 10 shekels, which is about three bucks. And what they observed was that the fine actually increased the number of late pickups. Right? 10 shekels? You can have my kid all night for 10 shekels. Like that's, that was, that was, everyone turned it into like, that's, what, a, what a price. That's, and so turned a very otherwise pro-social kind of incentive into something very transactional, and it really cheapened it a lot. And so, so many of our, uh, I think, approaches to financial incentives need to recognize that, you know, people go into healthcare for a reason. It's a very pro-social field. Probably a lot of the approaches to changing physician behavior need to travel along those pathways. I think I'm going to stop here. Um, there are a bunch of uh, social examples that I could have given, but I won't. But um, uh, so, just in the interest of time, mention that. Um, really three things that are true today but haven't been true, uh, were not true 10 years ago that make me very optimistic about this field. One is that behavioral economics has really expanded our understanding of human behavior. We just know more about what it takes to motivate people. The second is that almost everyone is, is connected with a cell phone now. It's not always a smartphone, although smartphone penetration is tremendously increasing. And it sounds like a cliche, it is just easier to reach out and touch people now um, than it used to be. 
And third, we are in a phase right now with healthcare financing, and we've been in this phase before, but we're in a strong one right now, where um, we are shifting risk, financial risk, to providers. We now have a much more of a financial engine that will support the interest of places with muscle, like academic health systems, in trying to manage patients during those 5,000 hours. And I think the combination of three, these three things um, create a really bright future for this kind of work. So let me stop there. Thanks very much for the invitation. I think there is, uh, uh, we have a discussant, and I, I wanted to give some time for that. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, David, uh, for coming down here. Um, incredibly uh, rich experience. Uh, it's always uh, really valuable for like a classically trained economist to see all these um, new approaches and basically just you know uh, taking seriously uh, the notion of okay uh, how much will more information how much will more incentives actually do uh, and to actually test that go out into the field and then try to see how robust are the uh, kind of the standard models I think um, this is uh, really it pushes basically the discipline to think much harder about uh, the standard models we've been operating on um, certainly to uh, to define much more precisely what do we mean by incentives right it goes way beyond financial incentives it can include these social incentives I think that last study that you showed uh, with the pickup uh, fine I mean that may have just pointed us towards Maybe people had some price in their mind that some social costs they were incurring if they were late, and then they realized it, it suddenly it came from intrinsic to extrinsic, and that allowed them to um, just delay the pickup even further. And so I think that's it, it really prompts us to think much harder about the uh, the way we model uh, human behavior, especially in these uh, settings of making financial decisions, making uh, medical care decisions. Um, I think one, one um, challenge that I see for uh, this work is just to define more precisely the scope. Uh, you know, to how, how far can we take it? So um, there, we, we, it, it seems very compelling that in situations where you're likely to be impulsive, and may, you may have limited information, where you're required to make a decision very quickly, that that's, uh, that's going to prompt you to go with some instinct, and you may not be able to process all the information even though you may have been given it. Uh, you may not be aware of all the incentives. Uh, you may not be able or, you know, uh, to, to compare all the costs fully, and so uh, then you may fall back to some uh, templates that you've been, that have worked for you in the past or that you might think uh, others have chosen, so I think that's. Uh, so I, I'd be curious to see in the, in in future work, you know, what, how applicable is it to uh, certainly th these domains of medication adherence, uh, domains of um, you know changing, say, uh, lifestyle choices that are detrimental to your health. Um, overall, I, I'm not sure it it really invalidates our model of, uh, you know, individuals comparing the costs and benefits when they have uh, the resources to do so. Uh, I guess the puzzle really remains, you know, why did John Coors, I never wear a seatbelt? So it's, it's really hard to explain with standard economic theory. Um, I'm not sure uh, what kind of behavioral economic intervention would have gotten him there. Um, but I guess it just prompts us to, you know, come up with more sophisticated models that, that account for this. Now, models, economic models, no less, they won't ever explain all the outliers. And I guess John Corzang probably considered himself an outlier, you know, given his achievements, given his resources, given his uh, education. So um, he, may, he may have thought he's an outlier. He doesn't need to wear a seatbelt uh, for some reason uh, that, you know, he's... he's He's got the best driver in the state of New Jersey, maybe. Uh, but which, which isn't saying much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, I mean, a small, it's a Jersey. garden state. That's right. It's, <laughs> and they all drive like crazy. Um, so, the, uh, so I think what, what this work points towards is it, it prompts us to 
kind of understand better the, the responses to these, uh, you know, say, you know, first generation incentives of just uh, putting a deductible out there or putting a brute force financial incentives and to see, to essentially calibrate them. And then I think the, what would be valuable now to know is, um, can you give us prescriptions uh, in advance, you know, how we should calibrate them. So you, you, you report on the, all these studies that show that there are significant differences in, uh, in human responses to these various uh, plan designs and incentive designs. And I would wonder, is there a framework, a theoretical framework that gives us some guidance you know, when we go ahead and when you, we basically want to offer policy implications uh, for, for designing uh, uh, programs so that you know, we can be assured that the people will adhere to them more faithfully. So I think that's, um, that's something. Uh, so it's, for, for now, I see a, a collage of evidence, if you will, uh, very compelling that um, the standard uh, simplistic way of you know, perhaps offering financial incentives may not get us all the way there, may so and sometimes be counterproductive. But uh, um, they're, they're the alternative, I, I don't see it um, as articulated as we might wish it to be so that we have some better guidance what, how to design the plan. Uh, for instance, you, know, the, you, you mentioned the, the plan that gives you $150 incentive if you do this, all these exercises. It's, I agree that it, probably that's not the best plan design, so now the question would be, okay, what is the uh, improved design? And I guess we have two opportunities here. We could try to come up with a theoretical framework and then that could give us some guidance or we could just design a, a bunch of permutations in the plan design uh, that, and then just see, you know, and then use our big data analytics to see, you know, which one worked, uh, which one is more likely. I guess in the, the only issue there would be, okay, you know, to what extent can we extrapolate? So um, the, I, was, I was also pleased to see that you know, you're the principal of a consulting firm that tries to capitalize essentially on these insights, presumably, and um, you know, as a classically trained economist, I would say there, if, if people make these systematic mistakes, or you, know, you call them irrational, but they're kind of departures from what we would predict, uh, there should be a profit opportunity, so both for you know, uh, private companies for government agencies to design, design improvements, and uh, we should see those. So these commitment devices, I think, are one area that probably is going to grow, and uh, so that's one um, really interesting field that we might, uh, where we might see a lot of innovation that's, that's going to improve, um, get, essentially give the consumers the tools when they learn that they have these decision biases, they have loss aversion, they are susceptible to framing effects. In this case, they, the consumers may say, okay, I know that I'll be susceptible to these biases, so I need to get help in advance. I need to kind of equip myself, you know, put on the, the armor so that I won't be tempted, right? So I, I buy this uh, little alarm clock that's gonna jump off my bed or the nightstand uh, so that I'm prepared. I basically, while I'm still rational and I anticipate that tomorrow I won't be able to get up immediately, I need to buy this commitment device. And so I think that's, um, uh, that's a really interesting area you know, where, we, where we might um, see a lot of innovation. And you know, paradoxically enough, I think in this case, education may improve uh, our ability to adhere to uh, you know, better lifestyle regimes because if, if we know we're susceptible to these biases, these departures from you know, what you call the rational model, then um, we might be able to equip ourselves much better in advance to, to cope with these. So, so, that's, uh, so in that sense, I wouldn't completely count out the educational approach, except that I wouldn't tell people to stop smoking. I would tell people to say, you know, your smoking cessation program may not work, so here is uh, what you need to learn about yourself, how you're likely to respond to it, um, why, where there might be a flaw in the program, and here is some tools that we can give you to, um, you know, 
make it more likely that you'll succeed with the program that's out there where we'll offer you a different one. But overall, um, thanks again for coming down. It's uh, excellent. Great, thanks. I hope we have uh, time for a few. Uh, I, I know you didn't leave before too long, but hopefully there's time for a few questions if people have questions. with, for example, paychecks reduces the success of them, and correct me if I was wrong, but uh, I was curious if there's any research that discusses if it is bundled, if some sort of notification would kind of make that same impression as giving a check or cash? Yeah, no, it's, uh, thanks for the question. <coughs> you know, I, I think the, the basic principle is how salient is this, and if it's bundled in a paycheck, it gets hidden. So it's the problem of the, the hidden incentive is no incentive at all. What you say makes perfect sense to me. I've not seen a study that would um, uh, demonstrate that, but it seems like a very testable hypothesis. Could you bundle information and bundle rewards within paychecks, but then make them salient some other way? I mean, you could imagine uh, simple ways of doing that, that, that you get an email that said, in your paycheck this week, you know, big red letters on an email message, there's an extra 20 bucks because you're not a smoker, and, and try to reinforce that information. I think that, I don't know whether that would work, but it would certainly, in my mind, be on the mediating pathway <coughs> towards greater success. I think the problems with the bundled paychecks are sort of as Lauren suggested, I think we've been a little bit in a trap in assuming that people are, ra are, are rational and have a certain kind of world model. And if we just understand the model better, if we get better at the modeling, then we have some tools to move those things forward. Just like I'm not against education, uh, just as Lauren said, I think we just now need to redirect education less to smoking is bad for you, to here's how people mess up when they're trying to quit smoking, like a different kind of educational tool that helps us move our behavior forward. That might be one of them for making what was previously hidden more visible. But I don't know. I mean, it's a testable hypothesis, and um, there's sort of an infinite number of them. Yeah? Um, so outside of the RCD environment, in the real world, I think the one challenge that's really clear is how long do the incentives have to be in place to change behavior, and can behavior regress once those incentives are removed? Yeah, I, I think it's how a great- How do you think we can deal with that and are right. replace the financial incentive with more of a social incentive in which family and friends or- uh, Yeah, I, I, I love your question. Um, you know, when we do these RCTs, they're for a limited period of time. The longest ones we've ever done have been about a year, sometimes a little bit of a washout period afterwards. So you give incentives for a year and you watch, watch for another three months. We always see some decline in effectiveness. And I'm sure that it would continue to decline if we could watch people further. If NIH would just give us more money, we could watch people forever. Um, and, and I think it's a real problem because um, if you're thinking about medication adherence for cardiovascular disease or diabetes or hypertension, these are lifelong conditions. Um, even the smoking, I didn't show you, but in those results that I showed you with smoking, if you follow people for another six months, the, the, the quit rates go way down. People start up smoking. You still see differences, but the overall effectiveness <coughs> declines over time because there's some recidivism with tobacco. So I think your point is a really good one. Um, there are related questions, which is, do some of these things work better for some people rather than others? Can we, you know, in, in a kind of world of precision medicine, do some people do better with regret lotteries and some people with loss aversion or something. And uh, none of us has any idea of that. Again, the studies are all powered for their main effect. Never enough for us to look at subgroups to see if there are differences. Maybe, maybe Republicans act one way and Democrats act another way. I don't know. So I have a question. It's a real world small sample experimentation that Brian Brew and I were involved in. So we were trying to, to do work essentially convincing state legislatures to expand Medicaid. So we did an analysis to basically show people the high federal match rate for Medicaid expansions. How it was economically rewarding for them. Employment would go up, uh, state economies would be richer, state budget would, would save some money. The first time we did a round of study, we basically said, you know, here's the good things that will happen to you expand Medicaid. So we were singularly unsuccessful. The next time around, we tried the, the, the loss aversion therapy where we said, you've already lost. 5,000 jobs because you can expand Medicaid. But here's how you can change the situation around it. And you've already lost these billions of dollars. 
I'm sad to say that didn't work either. <laughs> uh, and so you know, we were targeting fairly conservative state. So do you have any suggestions for a, a next approach on something to convince state legislators? Yeah, well, I think that the approach is to vote in November. <laughs> um, and that's, that would be, because I think, uh, you know, in all seriousness, these are, you know, it was a political issue. And, um, uh, but even if it weren't political, I think it is a, it is a challenge to convince people to do things. I, I, uh, I teach negotiation also, and one of the, you know, really important lessons of negotiation is that people do things for their reasons, not yours. Um, it sounds like you prevent, presented two very good reasons, either in a loss frame or a gain frame, and it wasn't effective, but I think there was just so much, the political headwinds are really too strong uh, in that particular uh, uh, context. Um, so, you know, it, uh, negotiating skills turn out to be really useful <laughs> in that setting. Lawrence. So I, I have a, another, more, perhaps more fundamental question. So, so these responses that you, you know, suggest Right, how we improve the, the design. Uh, you, you could argue, okay, if people have this present bias and it's hurting them, uh, one is to you know change the choice architecture around the change of you know their environment. The other approach might be, can we train them to reduce that present bias? Right? Can we uh, can we train people to not be swayed as much by framing? Um, can we train people to uh, essentially discount their loss of their, their impulse to be loss of us? Uh, essentially, can we alert them that they may have all these say, departures from the optimal behavior and that hurts them? And so, what, yes, one response is to change the, the environment for them and adapt it so that even when they make these mistakes, they, uh, they, they uh, these mistakes actually work in their favor. The alternative, maybe it's just a complementary approach, might be can we educate or uh, train people to reduce, you know, these essentially these reflexes yeah. that you des describe. Uh, well, it's, I think it's a it's a really good question. I, and, and actually, following up on this, don't we, um, if if we improve that environment, don't we? Uh, uh, remove or reduce the possibility that people will develop this, essentially this, you know, if you will, willpower muscle, you know, the, yeah. the self-discipline, the deferred gratification, all the virtues, you know, all Ben Franklin's virtues that he's been uh, telling us, right? How are we ever going to get there if the environment is built so that we, we don't have to, uh, you know, be that discipline? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's part, partly underlies concerns about nanny states and the like, yeah. is that, you know, you get, you know, give a man a fish, he eats for a day, teach a man a fish, he eats for a lifetime. So uh, here's my thought experiment, but it could be turned into a real experiment. Um, we want to get people to save more for retirement. And so a three-arm trial, usual care, you know, whatever we do for retirement, in an employer group, a group that, where people get defaulted into a higher contribution to their 401k plan. So that's what Bridget Madrian, an economist, mm -hmm. at, she was at Penn at the time, now she's at Harvard, did, demonstrating that if you you know, the default, at least for me at Penn and to my retirement plan is zero percent contribution, but we could default me to 5%. Um, and she demonstrated that we, that people, people will, more people will contribute more money into their retirement plan when they're defaulted at a higher level. So that could be the second arm. And the third arm could be, you know, um, sessions in which you educate employees about, you know, you're going to not think enough about the future and um, here's how you can deep bias yourself. I don't know exactly how we would do it. Um, so that's a testable hypothesis. I'm going to bet on Bridget Madrian every single time uh, because I think that this, the, it's just cognitively expensive. You know, as I said, the, the mind is a high resistance pathway. I bet you can move some people, but I bet it's just easier to create the nanny state kind of thing. Now we've and, and automobiles have done that. The John Corzine solution to automobiles. They don't. I don't think they do this anymore. There used to be cars where you could, once you get in, you couldn't actually not put on the seatbelt. Like closing the car door, wrap the seatbelt around you so it, it totally took your options away from you or you had to like climb in in some weird way or cut the seatbelt. Like is, is my equivalent of the Bridget Madry and default people into this thing. I'm always going to bet on that. Um, not because I think people are lazy, but because I think people are busy and there's a lot of cognitive load. So I'm really like not a fan of 
of finding the new rational models. I just, like, I think I'm too old. Life is too short. Like, let's just, let's just get people to put the seatbelt on. I don't want to educate them. I just want them to wear the seatbelt. That's my idea. You got a, your hand up? I was just curious what your thoughts were on intrinsic motivation and specifically for um, physicians is something I've thought about. Like I'd like my physician to want me to feel better and like you were saying, I feel like that's part of why I went to medical school and then for good reasons we're trying to move away for fee for service. So what do you see as sort of bridging that? Yeah. Well I, I'm a big fan of intrinsic motivation. I think it drives most physicians. Um, and in fact, one of the ways to do it, I didn't get into it, is, is through some of these social things. I mean, physicians are highly selected to be incredibly competitive. They're good test takers and the like. And, and we can probably harness some of those things without having to create new extrinsic motivations that seem off-putting. Um, you know, even just public reporting for physician ability is extrinsic in some sense, but it is harnessing some pathways about improving quality and the like in your own standing that may not Meet, I don't know if that meets your standards of sort of a kind of social uh, Yeah, well, I was just, I mean, you had sort of hinted on, so we can imagine easily how to give people more money. How could you enhance someone's intrinsic award, reward? I guess we sort of do it by giving each other thank yous. Like, that's one way we do it, is like saying thank you to try to, or so sort of some sort of uh, greater, uh, I mean, greater well, recognition. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. No, I, I, you know, I think public reporting in general is some way to acknowledge this publicly, make something public. I, I, I went by too quickly, but the little stickers that you get after you donate blood that said, I donated blood today, is, is, is creating some behavioral residue, showing that you did something very pro social. Um, uh, one of the emergency room residents at Penn, uh, we've, we've supported her, she's developed a software program, she hasn't not named it yet, she's thinking of calling it High Five, or, um, in which you can effectively send little thank yous to, to your colleagues who did a good job, so the surgeon who comes down and sees your patient in the emergency department gets like a high five, like, thanks, you did a really great job. And I don't know, you know, if you were in second grade, your mom would put that on the refrigerator, you know. <laughs> um, it's the equivalent of putting it on the refrigerator in, in some way. Um, I don't know if those things are gonna work, but I, I'm, you know, people are very social and they care People care what other people think about them. And um, that's a really fundamental thing. And uh, in fact, it's people are sort of sociopathic when they don't care what other people think about them. They don't like those people. So um, I think we should be harnessing more of those strategies. I don't exactly know how to operationalize them, but maybe you will figure that out. 